Hi and welcome back to Reviving an Idler. In this episode, it's a little change from the norm once again and we're going to be looking at the gaff spar here and some of the things that you may well be looking at doing to your spars and your woodwork in the next couple of months. So what have I got for you this morning? Well, sitting in front of me is Idler's old gaff spar. And what I thought I would do is put together a quick video on how you go about re-leathering the saddle, how you go about sanding back, cleaning up, getting rid of these uh, sort of black spots uh, and re-varnishing a spar. And I realize we are a, a long way away from needing to use spars on idler at the moment we've got a lot of work still to do and um, but there's going to be a lot of people in the next sort of couple of weeks if they haven't already started looking at redoing uh, either their spars or maybe their masts on their dinghies or just other woodwork uh, in and around their boats for the upcoming season so i thought i'd put this together a little bit earlier than i had originally planned uh, just so that it's out there uh, for you guys in the next couple of months so it's also a two-pronged attack on my part. It's something that I can get done, get it finished and out of the way and off the tick list so I can feel like I've actually achieved something um, this month so far. Um, it also gets me out of the rough and tumble weather outside, um, which is also quite nice, getting cozy by the fire. A bit self-preservation. First of all, let's have a little go over and see what the component parts are of the gaff saddle and the spar. So obviously the main part is the actual saddle itself and it's wrapped in this leather um, and that's just to protect the actual mast and the, the coatings on the mast from the, the metal work on it. It's got some parallel beads, some rope that just ties it into the mast, stops it slipping and jumping off. A little hinge here so it can actually tie into the spar itself and then we have the main halyard attachment and underneath you'd also lash in the uh, corner of your sail. Going along the spar as you can see quite a lot of blackening, tired varnish etc and then we also have these little chocks and they are tying in the spans so there'd be bits of rope which would go up in a sort of V section tying into the uh, the peak halyard and this boat has two, it's got two spans here so one at either end and all the way at the end we have a little hole here and that just allows us to lash in the peak of the sail. Now the spar itself is uh, about 14 feet long or 4.3 meters um, and it's about 10 kilograms, 12 kilograms, something like that. I've absolutely no idea what that is in um, bags of sugar but it's, uh, I mean, it's a fair old weighty bit of wood to be sent all off on such a small boat as I'd like. These uh, traditional boats, they used heavy rigs, heavy was good, it sort of dampened down the rocking and the motion of the boat. So they made themselves quite stable, quite uh, comfortable boats, um, partly because of that extra weight aloft. The first thing we need to be doing, um, as with everything that we come to do uh, in a restoration sense, is we get rid of all the dead material. So we're going to get all this varnish off, going to get that leather off uh, there, make sure that that's not rusted and heavily corroded under there. Now, I'm not seeing anything too uh, nasty going on in this spar so far, it was quite well looked after. Uh, there's only sort of really cosmetic issues on the surface uh, that need dealt with. Uh, get our masks on, let's get our scrapers out and uh, hop to it. Nice bit of leather. That'll be going back into Idler. <laughs> become the templates for the replacement leather. Now 
Now for the next bit we're going to be looking at dealing with some of the blackening, some of the rot spots that you get uh, forming underneath parts of varnish that have uh, maybe cracked or chipped. And in order to address that, I've taken the spar outside. Now there's two reasons for that. Um, firstly, in order to deal with this, I'm going to be using oxalic acid, which is a, a very mild acid or a form of bleach, essentially. And that does a very, very good job of uh, taking the worst of the colour out. Um, because it's an acid, um, I obviously want to be able to dispose of it in as a responsible manner as possible. Uh, and that doesn't mean pouring it all over the workshop floor and then soaking it into everything. So what I have decided to do to deal with it is once I put the acid onto the wood, I work that in, clean it up, we then wash that acid off. Now I've got two options, I can use an alkali solution or I can just use lots and lots of water. Um, the volume of water is going to form part of my method of disposal and that is I'm just going to douse it, I absolutely soak it. Now we have a natural sink here anyway, um, lots and lots of water is going to neutralise the acid so it's not going to have any lasting effect uh, on the ground itself. The ground itself is also a road. It's a hardcore road, there's just mud, gravel, grit, all kinds of yuckiness on the ground anyway, so it's also going to form a natural sink before it leaks its way into the wood behind me for argument's sake, or into the farmland that surrounds it. So it's, it's never going to leave this area in any concentration that's higher than uh, natural acidity of the soil. So bear that in mind. How are you going to dispose of the acid if that is what, uh, if that is a road you're going to go down? If you don't have the means to dilute it heavily with water, um, I would recommend doing something to neutralise it. So find some sort of alkali solution and try and uh, neutralise the acid. So you're putting something that's pH neutral uh, back down the drains or wherever it is you're, you're going to be safely and responsibly disposing of it. So we'll mix that up just now and we're going to need some hot water and uh, some oxalic acid crystals. Add into the mix of course some rubber gloves and eyewear and we basically want to take ourselves some Oxalic acid available quite widely on the interweb. Open it up, a little jug of warm water, and we want to take a few scoops of this. Now, we don't want it to be overly concentrated because we are dealing with soft woods, and we want it just basically to take the worst of the colour out of the stains. We're not looking to melt the wood or burn it or do anything too serious. And it's not an overly fast reaction. I want to make sure that all the crystals are dissolved. Yeah, maybe add a wee bit more. Okay. And we are simply going to paint this on to the worst of the areas. So we've given it a few minutes just to let that soak in. We're going to give it another light coating of the solution, uh, give it another few minutes just to soak in, and then we'll start washing it off. Right, we've left this for about one cup of tea and we're just going to give it a quick ragging down with a scotch bright pad or a sponge and uh, douse it with oodles and oodles of water. That's just going to neutralise the acid by dilution and it's also going to wash all the nasty acids away and more importantly for, for me at least it's, it's going to neutralise anything that's washed off or dripped off the wood that's landed on the ground beneath me so not causing any lasting environmental damage by what we've done here today. Now we're not looking to overly scrub because this is soft wood so there's going to be hard and soft areas of the wood. Your age rings are going to be harder than the softer pith in the middle eh, and we can very easily scour that down with or without acid but when it's weakened by having the acid on it you can um, exacerbate that issue. So we're going to gently just give it a rub down just to take any kind of raised areas off with this.
Once we've given it a quick rub down, next thing to do is just wash off and wash away all that acid. And when I say douse, I really do mean douse. I mean pour on water like you're trying to put out a house fire. Want that water to soak right in to any acid trapped in the fibres of the wood. I want to make sure that there's enough water there to dissolve further and dilute that acid away down to, to zero, okay? So, loads of water. So we'll give that a chance to drip dry and get the stove going so it can dry it properly inside of the workshop and and while that's all happening I'll get cracking with some of this sewing. Well this next bit is really quite simple. We are about to leather up the gaff saddle and we already have the templates that we took off uh, from the saddle originally so that makes it really very very easy we take our leather, in this case I've got some 5mm uh, veg tan bridle leather or saddle leather uh, so it's nice heavy strong stuff it's going to last a long time, take a lot of abuse you're also going to need a couple of extra things if you're doing any kind of leather work. Now, I actually do a fair bit of leather work in my spare time anyway. I make sporins and things like that, leather sheaths uh, for knives and whatnot. So I tend to have the majority of tools uh, that you may require. However, a couple of the things that you may need to get in, especially for a project like this, is going to be a type of thread. Now, I like to use artificial sinew. Now, you can buy it on big reels and it's usually a better way to do it. Um, however, for this purpose, I wanted this colour in particular, so I ordered just a small sample of this. Artificial sinew is a plastic thread. It's not actually made out of sinew, but it is made to replicate the sort of the real animal sinews that you would get uh, in making a Greenland kayak, for argument's sake. It is incredibly strong thread. Um, you don't necessarily need to go with artificial sinew for what we're doing here today, but um, I kind of swear by it because it's bomb-proof thread. The leather will tear before the thread snaps, and that's always uh, encouraging. A couple of other things you're going to need. A nice solid set of shears. Okay, scissors simply will not do the job. You need proper medics shears to get through that thickness of leather. Or a knife, a Stanley blade of some sort. A couple of the other little tools you may need. Obviously, you're going to be needing some needles, some sail making needles to do the job. Just make sure they're not the, the, sort of the triangular headed ones, they're just flat, round, standard needles. Uh, fairly easy to come by. Darner's needles, sail maker's needles, they do the same job. You need some prickers, so essentially sharp forks. Um, you can use a bridle or a bridle if you like, however these set out a nice line, okay, see if they're all the same size, so even if you just mark your leather as you go along, you can then make the hole a little bit larger with a drill bit or with a, a bridle or a bridle, depending on how you're going. Um, and I also like to finish up my leather work with little tools like this. And they are little gouges. This one here takes the sharp angle, the 90 degree angle off your leather and you simply run it around and it cleans it up. And this one here gouges out little lines. So if you wanted to uh, hide your thread, you can run this along the edge of your pattern and it will uh, recess in a groove that your thread can lay in. That's good for protecting your thread so you don't get unnecessary wear. Other things that are dead handy are uh, hole punches. Again, using them with a, a hammer. A sailmaker's palm is always quite handy, um, feeling that uh, a pair of pliers as well for pushing and for pulling the needle back out. So there's lots of little tools that you may need to consider purchasing if you haven't already got them. They are all fairly cheap however though and once you have got them they are fairly resilient and they will last you a long time and they're always quite handy to have on board, especially on a traditional boat such as Idler. So the first thing we need to be doing is marking out the templates and cutting out the materials. Um, we're using the old uh, leather from the gaff saddle as a template for that. 
So we'll mark out slightly larger than the original templates. Uh, that gives us room to play with and fold them in the middle once we've cut one of the curves so we get it equal on both sides. Using our sliding square to get good angles, we're going to mark out the holes uh, for the actual gaff saddle to attach to the spar uh, through those bolts. And we're going to use a hole cutter uh, just to mark out the corners to give ourselves a nice rounded edge. And then we're gonna cut them out using a Stanley blade. Our nice edging tool finishes up the hole, cleans up the 90 degree angles and just makes things sit a little bit prettier. And we'll mark out uh, the cutouts at the ends just using a, a snap shackle. You could use anything at all. The, the snap shackle just happened to be the right size for the job. So uh, use that. And again, finish it up with our edging tool. Well, having created the leathers, next thing I want to be doing before it's uh, sewn in, marked in and sewn in, is I want to quickly put some oil onto this. And that's gonna do two things. First of all, we are going to be looking at protecting the outside from any further grimy marks, okay? We're gonna try and keep that looking relatively nice. Uh, and it also allows us a chance to oil the inside face of the leather, which is the, the under skin side, okay? This would be the where the fur would lie, this would be the under skin side, uh, and that is far more absorbent uh, for, for oils and things like that. So we get that into there, it can penetrate nice and deeply and uh, increase the longevity of these pieces of leather as that will stay uh, supple uh, for a lot longer. Excuse the situation, these are the uh, benches for the, the yacht Second Haven, so I've just been giving them a clean up and an oil, but that's part of another project. Uh, and this is the original inside piece of the leather we found on the inside, so I've again, again I've oiled that. Our new pieces. Now I've just got a thin mixture of linseed oil and uh, white spirit. Just give it a little gentle coating. Nothing too major. As long as it's getting wet, it's getting good. Now you'll notice it goes dark very quickly and then very quickly returns to light and that's just the oil soaking in. It's very very porous these veg tan leathers there, they take a lot of oil. This is like dropping oil onto a sponge. It just disappears, soaks right in. Well, I hope you can see, and I hope you agree, that that's a lot 
nicer a colour. Not quite as dark. Uh, knocked a lot of the uh, the staining out. So the next step is we give it a quick blast with the sander. Well, that was as fun as sanding's ever going to be, uh, but I think we've got it into a pretty smooth finish, which is important for the adhesion of the uh, varnishes that are shortly to go on. And as you'll see, the bulk of the staining has largely gone. There's always going to be trace elements, and the only real way to get rid of all of it entirely is to very heavily sand it. Um, the problem with doing that is then you're removing a lot of material from the spar even if it's a couple of micromillimetres on the outside, by the time you've taken account the entire circumference, you actually are removing a fairly significant um, a bit of wood uh, from the spar. So we don't really want to do that. And you've got to remember the longevity of the spar as well. In the future, we will be looking at doing refinishing and all sorts of things uh, as we move forward with the project. So we want to try and leave as much uh, material there for future uh, renovations as, as we can as well. Once we get the varnish onto that, uh, what is left is going to only add to the character. Um, as I think I've said before, I quite like the workboat look myself, and I don't want this boat to look brand new, which I think will be fairly impossible anyway, but um, <laughs> uh, I do want her to have a little bit of um, old character to her, that, so that anybody uh, looking at her can tell immediately that she is an older boat, but is in good condition. Um, and that goes for myself as well. I want to be able to look at her and know her uh, pedigree. However, for yourselves, uh, you may not want to have that workboat look and you may well want to take it down a little bit further. And uh, my advice would be at this stage to do another light coating of the oxalic acid um, and really work it into the little grooves and perhaps scour a little bit deeper. Um, uh, don't scratch away, we're not to removing too much material, but you know, give it a good uh, scrub, perhaps with a, a toothbrush or something like that, a light brush or a nail brush, just to try and uh, encourage a little bit more removal, and then a further light sanding on top of this. Um, and that will allow you to remove quite a bit more of the staining. I think you'll probably agree though that uh, from what she was to what she is now, I think she's in a pretty good place and uh, I'm quite happy with that. So the next thing we want to be looking at doing is giving it a quick uh, wash down with some thinners uh, just to remove all the dust and uh, let that dry and then we'll look at getting everything uh, de-dusted and ready for varnishing. Well, there are hundreds of uh, varnishing tutorials available online, uh, on YouTube in particular, um, and all of them kind of tailored specifically to certain things, um, as well as some general overviews. Uh, so I'm not going to hammer the point too heavily on how you go about varnishing a spar. That kind of stuff is available freely online uh, elsewhere. But the, the, the underlying theme in almost any project is prepare your surfaces, get it nice and clean, dust-free, dust-free environment as best as possible, um, and apply numerous very thin coats uh, and follow the instructions on the product that you're using. Okay, they'll be printed on the can or a, a data sheet that accompanies it. So just pay attention to that stuff. It is all uh, pretty essential information. So so I know it's very tempting just to throw it straight in the bin, but uh, it does help to, to cast your eye over it. Uh, other than that, just numerous uh, applications of very thin coats of varnish going onto the spar just now and uh, keeping the workshop nice and cosy with that fire burning as often as uh, as long as possible.
So returning to the leather work, we've got both sides of the leather being oiled and they're now touched dry. And I'm just marking them out uh, on the saddle where sort of the top is, where the sides are, just to give myself some reference points that I can follow. And more importantly, marking out the inside and outside sheets of leather and where they line up and where they meet each other. Because they're forming round a curved surface, the outer part has got further to travel than the inner part and so I can't use the forks to line up the holes. I need to basically mark the outer sheet, which is the larger sheet, uh, with the correct spacing uh, using a fork and a punch. And then I'll tie that on to the inner sheet and sew it together so it can't shift and move around. And then what I'm going to do is mark the holes using a broadle or a bradle and that allows me to locate where the holes are and then I can take them back out and I use a drill just to quickly cut those holes and make it clean. Once I've marked up uh, the holes in the outer sheet, I'm going to punch a couple of holes, larger holes, in the bottom of the outer sheet, and they are to allow moisture to drain out of the actual leather saddle. Um, it is a piece of steel that's inside of this leather work, um, and steel will rust, it's galvanized, and it's very well galvanized. Um, but if there is fresh water, rain water collected inside of this leather work uh, for any significant amount of time, it will eventually uh, corrode through and uh, rust the saddle. So we want to try and mitigate that and allow free air movement and a bit of drying. So I punch a couple of big holes and that should allow a bit of drainage. So here I am just stitching the two sheets together so I can get everything lined up and mark the inside holes on the inside bit of the leather. Using the broadle, just punching through the holes that I cut using the forks. Just follow through that hole and make a little mark on the inside sheet of leather and that just lines everything up. I can then cut off the strings, take it all apart and then again use the drill just to open up uh, those holes. So the sewing part uh, is pretty straightforward. We're going to use a saddle stitch. Uh, so that uses a length of thread with two needles, one on either end. And we're going to line up all the holes that we previously marked so we can see where we're going. And we essentially put one needle all the way through, find the midpoint in the string. And then we move to the next hole and we send both needles through the same hole, but in opposite directions. So pull that one through and then we send the other needle back through the same hole, uh, but going in the other direction. Pull it tight and then we move on to the next hole and we repeat the process all the way around.
And as we approach the end of the sewing, everything's going to get pretty tight. We are pulling this rather thick leather around a rather large lump of metal, so things are going to get a bit difficult. So we can use a pair of grips, just bend it round. The leather will stretch, especially as it's oiled. So we could just bend the leather around, pull it in, and as it all sews up nice and tight, once it starts to settle, it will uh, position itself where it should be around the actual saddle and uh, take that shape perfectly. And ultimately, after a little bit of sewing, we end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Nicely coated, nice oiled leather. That's going to be really good on the mast. It's not going to go anywhere. See, little drainage holes allows any moisture that does get in there to drain out, so you don't end up with sort of rusting of the, the galvanised steel there. And the finer edge here, that remains to be cut off, and then we give that just a quick rub down, you call it a burnishing. And that just rounds off the, the edges slightly and makes it look a little bit prettier. But essentially, that is the gaff saddle now fully leathered. Have a few more coats to go with the varnish for the spar, and then all we do, reassemble it, and that's the job done. Well, this next bit is the bit where I'm supposed to show you the great unveiling and how beautiful the whole spar looks. And it's pretty good. I did make one small error yesterday. In my haste to get this out to you as soon as possible, I packed some varnish on this yesterday, the final coat, uh, at the same time as I put the fire on. And we had a cold snap overnight, so we had a very, very rapid temperature change as the varnish was on. Complete stupidity on my part. Um, don't really understand what I was thinking, why I was thinking it. And in the end, what has actually happened is we've ended up with some wrinkling, which I'll just show you just now. Now, this may be a bit tricky to show you, but this wrinkling travels up about half of the spar. It doesn't affect the performance of the varnish, but it looks horrible. So I'm going to have to rectify that. Now up at the gaff end, uh, the varnish is beautiful, lovely and clear. It's really hard to show you on this camera, but it's looking nice. It's looking lovely up this end. Okay, so what has happened is overnight the temperature has uh, plummeted, it's still winter time in Scotland so it's, it's low temperatures, albeit it is a warm uh, season this year, it's a warm year. Um, down by this end, down by the fire, um, the temperature was rising rapidly because I had the stove on. The wood would have been acclimatised to the atmospheric temperature in here which would have been round about zero at the time. Varnish went on, lovely, looked beautiful. And as the temperature rose rapidly at this end of the shed, which is where the fire is, it caused the top side to dry faster than the underside, which was still cold. And that has caused a, and that has caused contraction wrinkles where it has been pulled in over the top of a, of a sort of more gelatinous bottom layer. Up at this end of the spark, where the temperature change was much more slow, um, the varnish has set as it should and is looking lovely. Well, needless to say, that is a little bit of a disappointment. I was hoping to get that all polished up and looking beautiful for you for the end of this video. Um, I would like to release this video as swiftly as possible. Um, so if you want to see how the actual spar ended up, you can check out my Instagram account and I'll pop some photos up there for you guys as soon as it is done. Um, and in all likelihood, in the next video, I will do a quick sort of once over just so you can see how the actual spar is for anybody not using Instagram or anything like that. Um, outside of that, uh, all the things I've shown you in this video are all still completely relevant. The error was completely uh, on the user's end of everything I've shown you. It was my mistake doing something fairly silly and in haste and not uh, paying attention to what I was doing. So um, I only have myself to blame and uh, I'm the one who has to pick up the pieces, so my bad. 
It does, however, serve as a very good lesson as to why you should always pay attention to what you're doing, always read the instructions on the back of the can, and make sure that you are setting up for success and not trying to rush yourself in any way. Well, I hope that episode was of some use to you. Um, varnishing is a kind of a subject into itself. There's a lot of things that you can do with varnish. There's a lot of things you can't do with varnish. Leather work in itself, again, is a completely separate subject. Uh, and there's a lot of things that you can and can't do with it. So a lot of things to learn, uh, especially leather and uh, spar work. Um, that's one of the wonderful things, I think, about wooden boats. There's a lot of skills, a lot of trades, all kind of roped into one. And to be a wooden boat builder, or a wooden boat user more in particular, uh, you kind of have to be a kind of jack of all trades. Lots of things, metal work, um, leather work, wood work, uh, finishing, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, mechanics, I would say electricians, there's all kinds of things you could be doing as a wooden boat owner uh, and builder. So it's a very exciting subject to get involved in. Anyway, a huge, huge thank you from me here at Bottom Boats. Um, we are still plodding away with Idler. We're doing great things with her plugging and her planking repairs. Um, again, it is just a very slow process, so like, there's not very much to see there at the moment uh, that you haven't already seen. But hopefully coming up next time, we are going to be getting a few more ribs installed, maybe have a look at the floors and focus on the actual plugging themselves. I did promise you a little episode uh, focusing on plugs themselves because again, it's a fairly large subject or it's turned into a fairly large subject. So we'll get that rolled out to you uh, very, very shortly. Anyway, a huge thank you from me to the patrons out there. You guys uh, never cease to amaze me with your uh, generosity and kindness, and I, I hope I'm in some way fulfilling your dreams uh, with these videos that I'm putting out there. Uh, so thank you so, so much. I honestly appreciate it. Uh, to every single one of you guys out there sticking comments down there, I really appreciate it. I do read every single one of them, and I do my best to uh, respond to every single one of them. Um, again, massively massively uplifting every single time i put a video out there you guys are straight away with the comments and uh, i love it it just really brings the spirits back up and keeps the momentum and the power behind the project uh, so thank you so much to that if you're just dropping in and you're enjoying what you're seeing fire uh, your finger down there onto the like button uh, get some comments down there Check out the rest of the videos down there, there there's loads of good stuff out there. Um, again, I do apologise for the earlier videos, the cinematography and the audio are shocking, um, but that is hopefully ironed out now. Anyway, uh, enough wittering, my hat's missing, so I'm going to have to say thank you so much once again, and uh, until next time, take it easy.